All right. Good morning, church. Happy Thanksgiving. Do we still get to say that? I'm going to ride it right through the weekend. Happy Thanksgiving. Uh, I was thinking about what I was grateful for. That's all right. We can clap about that. That's good. I was thinking about what I was grateful for this weekend. And uh, I really am grateful for all of you as I'm getting to know you a little bit and meeting a lot of you. Uh, really feeling grateful to be a part of this church family and the good thing that, that God is doing here. So uh, everyone recovering from their food coma okay? You're going to be able to stick with me for like a half an hour of preaching? I think we can do this in God's Word together. So uh, we are going to be taking a little break from our series in 1 Corinthians that we've been in. It's been awesome so far. We're going to pick that up. Uh, at the beginning of next year. So we're in this series through the holidays uh, called Doing Christmas. And if you miss Paul's letter to the Corinthians too much, just to help you kind of segue a little bit, we're actually going to be in a passage just by chance today from 2 Corinthians. So, you know, you don't have to miss them too much. But, uh, but we're going we're to be in this Doing Christmas series together. So as we get into it, let me ask you this. Are there any Seinfeld fans? Anybody watch Seinfeld at all? I got a few hands. Yes, right? Okay, so if you watch Seinfeld at all, uh, anybody know what Seinfeld is about? Like what the premise of the show is? It's about nothing. It is a show about nothing. So within the show, Seinfeld, there's this plot line where they try to develop this sitcom and they're like, hey, let's make this show about nothing. Everybody's making a show about something. Let's make a show about nothing. It really is about nothing. It follows this group of five friends or four friends, rather, around through, like, the everyday kind of happenings of their life. You sort of get to know them a little bit. You start to realize that they are just horrible, horrible people. So, so what happens at the very end, spoiler alert, from the series finale, and the, the series finale was, like, in 1998. So if you didn't see it at this point, I mean, it's a spoiler. So um, what happens in the final episode is uh, this group of friends watches this guy get mugged, and they don't do anything about it. And they vi- accidentally violate this thing called the Good Samaritan Law, biblical reference. And, uh, and they end up being in a trial, in a courtroom, and they trot out all of the people throughout the entire series that witnessed how these four friends live, um, what they're about, how selfish they are, and how self-absorbed they are. And it's hilarious. It's, it's very funny. Those of you who are fans know what I'm talking about. The thing is, you can tell a lot about a person from how they live their lives and how it is that they spend their time and their resources, how it is they spend the money that's in their pockets and the energy and the emotion. Um, in, In my law practice, when we have someone who has experienced some kind of a catastrophic injury and we want them, we want to show a jury what their life is like. We literally make something called a day in the life video. And it's like this camera that follows the person around to just to get a sense, a clarity of, of just the difficulty of their day-to-day experience. If you were to follow me around all day, one day with a little camera, or just creepily like follow me around behind a bush, don't do that. That's weird. But if you were going to do that, you would learn a lot about me. You'd learn a lot about me based on how I spend my time, how I spend my money, how I spend my energy and emotion. And as we enter this Christmas season, we often start to rethink how it is that we spend our resources, how it is that we uh, spend our time, because this, this Christmas season is a season of generosity, right? And we, we tend to sort of spend our resources a little bit differently than we do in other times of the year. Let me grab this little clicker thing right here. So the way I see it, when I think about the way we spend our resources, the ways that we try to be generous toward one another, it kind of breaks down into this relatively simple paradigm. So it starts with, there's the goods. There are the actual things themselves, the resources that we have that we tend to give, whatever that might be. It's, it's money, it's food, it's time, it's emotion, whatever those things might be. Then there is the giver. There's the person who actually gives those resources away to somebody else. And then there's the recipient. There's the one who gets to receive all of those things. And it's like this really simple thing, the way that we understand what giving and what generosity is. But what I'd like for us to consider this morning is that is it possible that in light of the gospel, that maybe these pieces, these three pieces, maybe aren't quite what we think that they are. Jesus and his followers, they claimed 
that the gospel somehow totally reshapes and totally reorients these three pieces as the way that, in the way that we think that they are and reframes how we understand giving and generosity. And we're going to take a look at this passage in 2 Corinthians chapter 8. And it was written just a couple of years after 1 Corinthians uh, that we've been studying that, like I said, we're going to go back to in the new year. So, uh, a little side note. I have a professor that would always say that, um, you know, when you jump into the middle of, of a letter like this, this is Paul writing a letter to the Corinthian church. And when you jump into a letter like this, especially kind of like in the middle, like we're going to, you get this sense that it's kind of like when you're sitting with a friend or you're in the car with a friend and their phone rings and they pick up the phone and they start talking a little bit and, and, and you hear half the conversation, right? So you're, you, you're kind of interested, like it sounds like an interesting conversation. You're trying to figure out maybe who they're talking to. Like, is it someone they like? Then you, you maybe their, their spouse or a good friend, they're very warm. Otherwise, maybe someone they don't like, they're a little snarky. You're kind of trying to figure it out just by listening to half of the conversation. Now, that's kind of what this is like when we're getting into the middle of uh, 2 Corinthians here. So, um, in a biblical epistle like this, in a letter like this, there's a backstory, and it's often revealed by the context. And that's the reason why you're always going to hear me. You often hear me say, hey, when you're reading the scripture, when you go home, if you like what you see here, read around it. Read as much as you can in the context so you can get, kind of get a sense and hear both sides of the conversation. So there's a backstory here in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 that's going to help us understand this amazing passage and kind of hear the whole conversation. So really, really quick, the 30-second version is this. The Christians in Jerusalem at the time. Jerusalem is like the birthplace of Christianity, right? It's not Jesus' birthplace. Jesus was born in Galilee, right? A little north of Jerusalem. Right? It's a little podunk town called Nazareth. But in Jerusalem, where, Christian, where Christianity was born, where Jesus rode in and, he, and he, he was prosecuted and he died and he rose again. Christianity is born there. The church was being born there. Um, the Christians in that town were suffering. Famine had come in. They, they had no resources. They had no food to eat. So Paul, who writes this letter to the 2 Corinthians, he had been going around to all of these non-Jewish towns, including Corinth, and, and planting these churches, and people were coming to Christ. And what he was finding was that in towns like Corinth, which, like we learned earlier, uh, which was this sort of metropolis that was this trading town, a seaport, there was a lot of money in that town. And then there's these people in, Jeru in Jerusalem that are lacking. So Paul decides to kind of put the pieces together. And he asks all of these churches um, that have these resources to take a little collection every week for a year. And at the end of the year, he's going to come back with a few other representatives and take what, collect what they've you know, gathered and bring it back to those who are in need in Jerusalem. So the Corinthians, apparently they started doing this for a little while. And then I guess it just, it just fell off. And now they know that Paul's coming back and the, the other representatives are coming back to collect what they promised they would give and they didn't have it and they know it's going to be awkward. And, and that's kind of where this story picks up. So now Paul wants to, to address this with the Corinthians. So what does he do? He decides to tell them a story. Actually, he tells them two stories. And, and he tells them a story about generosity. And he tells them a story that involves these three pieces that we talked about a moment ago, the goods, the, the giver, and the receiver. So let's kind of unpack that together. Let's take a look at this story. It starts with the goods. It says this, and now brothers and sisters, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. All right, let's stop there for a second. Now to, to address kind of this whole awkward situation that Paul's kind of walking into, he tells them the story about something that happened to the Macedonians. And, um, you know, the Macedonians, this is a, a, another group of, of followers of Jesus, just a little bit north of Corinth, a couple of hundred miles north. Actually, in our Bibles, we have some letters that Paul wrote to the Macedonians. It's called First and Second Thessalonians. And here we have Paul trying to help them understand what it is that happened to them. So what happened to them? What, is, what does Paul say happened to them? He says grace happened to them. And this word grace that's translated in our Bibles as grace, Paul uses this word in the Greek more times in these couple of chapters, in chapter 8 and chapter 9, than anywhere else in any of the letters that he writes. So there's some kind of connection here between what he wants to communicate with, with the Corinthians about generosity and about grace. So what is this word that he keeps using over and over again in chapter 8 and chapter 9 of 2 Corinthians? Well, it's this word here, this word charis. 
Um, any, anyone here maybe named Karis or have a friend named Karis or Carissa, right? It, their name means grace. It, it, it means this. Now, within this word Karis, it is, um, it's often translated grace in your Bibles. Many times in your Bibles, it's translated as the word gift. It's this idea of something that is totally unearned, totally unasked for. It's not like when you give a gift and then you kind of expect something in return. Like, that's not really a gift, right? That's like putting someone in your debt. This is more like a, a true gift that you give to someone else. Totally unearned, totally unmerited, and you give it to them. Um, out of your kindness and generosity. Also woven into this word, word is a concept that, oh, maybe some of us experienced this at the, the, the Thanksgiving table. Uh, anybody have any like awkward conversations come up? Like a, a little, uh, I don't know, Grandpa Joe like, uh, you know, shares an opinion that, that causes a disagreement at the table and everyone starts talking. If you didn't, that is good. You did the right thing. You're supposed to let that go and just like take another mouthful of stuffing. So, when that happens, though, and someone wrongs you in some way, and you, uh, you extend to them kindness instead of vengeance, you extend to them kindness instead of recompense, which you're entitled to do when someone has wronged you in some way. When you do that, you are extending to them, in Paul's language, charis. So forgiveness is the word that we use in English that is also included in this concept of charis. The other word that's often used with this word karis is the, is the idea of generosity, right? This notion that when I give of my stuff for the well-being of another, even if it costs me something, that's karis. All right, so Paul is telling this story about the karis that happened to the Macedonians. He says, um, he says, there's, the, there's our three words, gift, forgiveness, generosity. See, I, I got lazy with the clicker over here. In the midst of a very severe trial, their overflowing joy, their extreme poverty, welled up in, ge in rich generosity. For I testify that they gave as much as they were able. No, 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 no. They gave even beyond their ability. Okay, so let's take a look here. What it is that the, what are the, the, the goods that the Macedonians have here? We see here that they are in severe trial. That is referring to this concept of them being in this sort of acute crisis. We don't know what is going on, but something is going on. Some type of an acute crisis that they were feeling. Some very difficult season. And when you're in a difficult season in your life, when you're experiencing some kind of crisis, or when I am, it is normal for us to turn inward. To say, I'm in the middle of this crisis and I've got to deal with it. And don't hear me wrong. When you are in crisis, it is good and it is right for us to expend our energy and, and, and you know, work toward and lean on other people toward dealing with that crisis. But at the same time, there seems to be something happening here because they're experiencing some kind of crisis and yet... We're going to be talking about their generosity. What else does it say? It says that they're, extreming, they're experiencing extreme poverty. That's not the, the acute crisis that they're in. This is kind of like their longer-term situation. They, too, do not have much. They don't have much to give. And the grace that happened to them seems to be resulting in some strange math, the way Paul describes it, because the view of their stuff doesn't seem to calculate in the way that we would think. Our math says this. It says that if I have enough now and I have enough in the longer term, well, then I am positioned to be generous. And so we pursue accruing stuff. We pursue it relentlessly. We, we look out for ourselves and our tribe, often at the expense of others and their tribe, or at a minimum at some level of indifference towards others, hoping that if we can create this formula where I have enough in the short term and the long term, well then I'm positioned to be general, uh, generous. But the math of Jesus' followers, if you look at this verse, that Paul seems to write about is this. He says they were in severe trial plus extreme poverty, plus over, what does he say? Plus overflowing joy equals rich generosity. It's like the math is different. For us, it's like one plus one equals two. For, in this equation, it's like one plus one equals cucumber, you know? It's this totally different way of, of looking at this. And he says that these things together weld up in rich generosity. It reminds me of like a potion where like you put these like 
various ingredients in and like it just starts to like bubble over. Maybe it's like a science experiment that you do in chemistry and you put these ingredients thing and it just starts to bubble over. That's what he's describing here. And if I'm honest, it, it doesn't really make a lot of sense. And so something about the chorus that has happened to them is causing them to see their stuff, to see the goods a little bit differently. And so the story goes on. The, the, the Macedonians, in their severe trial and extreme poverty, gave as much as they were able and even beyond their ability. And Paul is not looking to shame the Corinthians here. He's telling them a story about something that happened to the Macedonians. So how is it that this math adds up? They, they, they seem to be seeing their goods differently. They're also seeing what it means to receive generosity differently. Let's, let's keep reading as we, as we look at the recipient in that equation. They're seeing their goods differently. Now let's take a look at the recipient. He says this, Entirely on their own, they urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service to the Lord's people. Okay, look at what it says here. It says, They pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing. And some of our Bibles say for the favor of sharing. And that word right there, privilege, some of our translations say sharing, it's the word charis, that they pleaded with them for the gift of being able to share and be generous. And I read that and I'm just like, wait, wait, what? Like we think about the gift as the thing that's being given to the recipient. But look at what he's saying here. Somehow, the grace, the chorus that happened to the Macedonians, somehow turned them so inside out that they now saw the privilege of giving and being generous to others as a gift that was being given to them. This is the economics of God's created world and the renewed world that he brings about through the good news of Jesus Christ. This is, is what you were created for. And, and we know it too. We, we know it deep down inside, whether you're a follower of Jesus or not. There's something inside of us that just kind of feels good when you are generous. Um, any Friends fans over here? The sitcom, it's sitcom Sunday here at Beacon. Any, any, any Friends fans? Anyone watch the show Friends? All right, here, check, uh, check out this, uh, this scene. For what, what are you talking about? Uh, well, yeah, it was a really nice thing and all, but it made you feel really good, right? Yeah, so? Well, it made you feel good, so that makes it selfish. <laughs> Look, there's no unselfish good deeds, sorry. Yes, there are. There are totally good deeds that are selfless. Uh, well, may I ask for one example? Yeah, it's, you know, there's... No, you may not. <laughs> That's because all people are selfish. Are you calling me selfish? Are you calling you people? <laughs> yeah, well, sorry to burst that bubble, Phoebes, but selfless good deeds don't exist, okay? And you know the deal on Santa Claus, right? I'm gonna find a selfless good deed. I'm gonna beat you, you evil genius. <laughs> hey, Joey, when you said the deal with Santa Claus, you meant... That he doesn't exist. Right. The yes, telethon. Hey, Joey. I just uh, wanted to let you know that I found a selfless good deed. I went down to the park and I let a bee sting me. What? What good is that going to do anybody? Well, it helps the bee look tough in front of his bee friends. The bee is happy and I am definitely not. Now, you know, the bee probably died after he stung you. PBS Telethon. Hi, Joey. Hey, Phoebes. I would like to make a pledge. I would like to donate $200. $200? You sure, Phoebes? I mean, after what Sesame Street did to you? Well, by supporting them, I'm doing a good thing, but I'm not happy about it. <laughs> so, they're a selfless good deed. All right, and you don't feel a little good about donating the money? I was saving up to buy a hamster. A hamster? What, those things are like 10 bucks. Yeah, not the one I had my eye on. It looks like we have surpassed last year's pledge total. Thank you, viewers. Yeah. And the pledge that did it was taken by one of our volunteers. Oh, boy. And may I say, one of our sharpest dressed volunteers. 
Mr. Joseph Tribbiani. Oh, look, look, Joey's on TV. Oh, isn't that great? Hey, my pledge got Joey on TV. Oh, that makes me feel so... Oh, no! <laughs> it, it's, it's funny. Listen, Phoebe in that whole episode is going around trying to find something that doesn't... Giving in some way that doesn't make her feel good, but she can't find it. And, and the reason is because she's on to something. We, we do feel good when we are generous because generosity is at the essence of the one who created us, in whose image every person in this room is made. And an open-handedness before God, surrender before him, allows us to experience his chorus, his gift, his grace, and rearranges the pieces such that giving and being generous toward others is in fact a, gi a gift that is being received. And that's what Phoebe was experiencing every time she, she tried. And that's what he goes on to say with the Macedonians here. He says, they exceeded our expectations. They gave themselves first to the Lord and then by the will of God also to us. They were surrendering themselves, allowing themselves to be open-handed before God. And it was reorienting and reshifting and rearranging everything that they thought they understood about generosity. Something about giving themselves over to this good thing that God is doing in their lives changed everything and, and so he goes on and he says so we urged Titus just as he uh, as he had earlier made a beginning to bring to completion the act of grace on your part this was that thing where they were going around and and collecting um, what everyone had gathered to give to these uh, Christians in Jerusalem in need so he says but since you excel in everything in faith in speech in knowledge in complete earnestness and in the love we have kindled in you see that you also excel in this grace of giving I am not commanding you but I want to test the sincerity of your love by comparing it with the earnestness of others this was like super convicting when I was reading this friends take think about what he's saying here he's saying just this is so true this is why I love being a part of the good thing that God is doing here at Beacon because here we are as a church family we're growing together in these really amazing things growing in faith growing in the ability to to speak about our faith growing in speech he says growing in under, in an understanding of God's word growing in an in authenticity of love and, and what Paul is getting at is as you grow in these things let there not be a disconnect between the growth in all of these things and growth in this gift, in the chorus of giving and of being generous. And, and, and so it's kind of like reshifting the way that we see everything. So the, the diagram here is obviously not what we think it is. The giver... It seems to be the recipient because what Paul's talking about here is he's saying that well when we give it is in fact a gift that we are receiving the gift of being able to be generous well if, if that's the case then where is the giver who is who is the giver in this little picture well let's take a look at what Paul says next and if, you're, if, if there's a, a portion of this passage that is worth committing to memory or something that I think we're going to find ourselves coming back to over and over again throughout the course of this series, it's this in verse 9. Look at what he says. He says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that, through his pov uh, so that you through his poverty might become poor rich so do you see what he's doing here he's he's telling another story he's telling a second story what story is he telling this this time he's telling the story of the good news about jesus and he's doing it through a money metaphor a giving metaphor and, and look at what it is that he's saying here he says you know you know the chorus the grace of our lord jesus christ you you've you've experienced it firsthand yourself and he and he tells this second story he tells this story uh, about how how God has given humanity the ability to do so much um, the ability to innovate and to think and to feel and to be present for one another and, and to cultivate and partner with him and to cultivate God's good world 
and we take the resources that we've been given and rather than spending it on one another and living in that economy, that math equation, uh, that, that, that is gospel math that we looked at. Instead, we add it up for ourselves and we work on kind of accumulating and accruing as much stuff for ourselves as, as possible, seeking out the well-being of myself and my tribe at the expense of another. And the result is the world that we live in, right? One marked by greed and selfishness. And yet Jesus comes and he steps into that place. He steps into that story. He gives up his riches and he steps into your story and into my story and into our broken world. He steps into our poverty. And he writes himself into that story. And on the cross, he absorbs all of the the sin and the guilt and the shame and everything that we've messed up in the world around us. He absorbs that into himself on the cross, absorbing our guilt and our shame and our pain and our suffering. But God's chorus is so strong, God's grace is so strong that not even death can hold him down. That death doesn't have the last word and he rises from the grave and Jesus rises again and he makes possible a new way, a new way of being human, a new humanity, a new world that he's bringing about, marked by the power and the presence of God, marked by that equation of generosity where one plus one equals cucumber, right? Where in fact giving toward one another is, is, is experiencing the fullness of who we were created to be. And the implications of him telling this second story. So he just told us this story about the Macedonians who were suffering and they had, um, they had some acute crisis going on. They were in poverty and yet they, were, they had overflowing joy. And he tells us about how they were they welled up in generosity. Things didn't seem to add up. And then he tells us this story. And the implication of this story is, is not just, hey, Jesus was generous, so you should imitate Jesus and be generous too. I mean, it's not less than that. It's, it's not like, you know, like my, my parents would say, hey, your, your brother, when I was a kid, like, oh, your brother gets straight A's. You should get straight A's. And I was like, oh, well, you know, I guess it's good. I should imitate him and try. It's, it, there's an extent to which that that's what he's saying here. It's not less than that, but it is more than that because look at what he says. He says, so that you through his poverty might become rich. It's not just look at what Jesus did and do what he did. He's trying to help us understand that we now have the resources to be generous. We have the resources to do what Jesus did because we are rich. We are rich in the gospel of Jesus Christ because he stepped into our poverty and our poverty became his and his richness became ours. That is what the Macedonians were experiencing. And that is what we have the opportunity to experience here together as a community. And as we rethink what generosity looks like going into this Christmas season, it's this. It's that, yes, the giver of all things, the one who stepped into our poverty and took on our poverty into himself so that we could have his richness, pours out his generosity, his chorus upon us. And now the giver gives to both, in our paradigm, the one who gives and the one who receives, actually receives all things through the good news of Jesus Christ. And that's the message that he's trying to help us understand here. That being generous towards others is a gift to you because you're a new kind of human being reformed into who you were created to be. And, and, you know, whether you've been following Jesus for a long time or this is all new to you, there's something deep inside that you do feel in this respect. Phoebe felt it, <laughs> right? There's something deep inside that you feel, that you come alive, you feel good, you feel warm when you give, and that's because it is who you were created to be. And when we are generous toward one another, we lean into the fullness of who we were created to be. Guys, that's awesome. It's the opportunity to become the humanity that we were intended to be all along. So what does this mean for us? What does this mean for us and and it, what is it going to look like for us to walk through our days realizing that the act of being generous is a gift 
being given to you. What, what is, it, it feels very backwards to us. Though, like I said, if you really search your heart and see what it is that you're feeling when you are generous, it's not as backwards as we might think. So what does this look like in our lives? Well, I couldn't help but think about how there's perhaps the most obvious one, the ways in which we handle our finances. Um, we, uh, and it's not so much about the amount of um, money that we give away, because you look at the Macedonians, and it wasn't about the amount of money. The, the, Paul wasn't telling them the story about the Macedonians, say, hey, look how much they're giving. You should give the same amount. He's telling them a story about what happened to them. And what is it going to look like for us to have a posture of the heart that is generous, that seeks out the gift of being generous with our financial resources? What is it going to look like for us to offer our expertise? I've gotten to meet so many of you, and I'm looking forward to meeting so many more of you. And there is so much skill and expertise in this room. Um, I, I, from, from carpenters and plumbers to lawyers and accountants and financial planners and doctors. And, and what is it going to look like for us to grow in the ability to be generous with our skills? To, to be able to, we think about like all of like the, the difficulties and the systemic issues that exist right here on Long Island. And, and how would your skills and the gifts and abilities and even the profession that you've been given, what is it going to look like to be generous with that? To experience the gift of being generous, receiving that gift of being able to share with others. And if you're, maybe if you're a financial planner, it's teaching others how to use their money well. If you're in the medical field, to be able to offer medical services to those who might not be able to afford it. That we would be uh, this little microcosm of the kingdom of God here as a church family where we are living that out. I know we do that already in so many ways. And what will it look like for us to continue to grow and experience the gift of being generous? I love that we have the food pantry available. It's one of the many ways that we can provide um, food resources to those who are in need. 283,000 Long Islanders will suffer from hunger this year. 283,000 of our neighbors. 182,000 Long Islanders were hungry last night. 39% of those were children. That's on this piece of dirt where we live. What is it going to look like for us to experience the gift of being generous? To receive the gift of being generous as we continue to feed those in need around us? What is it going to look like for us to maybe be a listening ear to the, one, the ones who are around us? There, there's that, that person at your office or your workplace that like everyone kind of runs away from because they, they have a lot to say and it feels like nobody wants to listen. And you would be surprised. I have experienced firsthand what, like, when you engage and you sit and you look them in the face and you look them in the eye and you create the space for them to tell you their story, how, how, how they open up and you start to get a sense of what it is that is in their heart. What is, what is it going to look like for us to be generous with our emotion, generous with the resource of the richness that the gospel has put inside of each one of us? What is it going to look like for us to be generous with our homes? Um, I, I did a study a while back looking at um, the meals that Jesus had with people. Don't ever underestimate the power of your dinner table. Jesus was constantly having meals with people. He goes up to Zacchaeus and he says, hey, I'm coming over to your house because something happens when a house is opened up and people go inside of it together and share a meal together. What is it going to look like for us to experience and receive the gift of being generous with our homes? Paul's not commanding them to be generous. He's not saying muster up the strength to be more generous. He just tells them a story and he says, let the, let the Spirit of God work in you to flesh that out in your context. So friends, may God help us to receive the gift of being generous with open arms because as we do, we become more of the people we were created to be. We bring about God's renewed world on earth as it is in heaven.